Our first call for Thomas Lippman of the Middle East Institute comes from Ten Mile, Tennessee, on our line for Republicans. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Rob. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? You got a question? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to see the Saudis increase production about 9,000%, and I'd also like to see us develop all the tar sands out west we've got in, here in this country. I think we probably got more oil locked up there than the Saudis have. I'm part owner, half owner of a small trucking company here in East Tennessee, and we're going broke, my friend, totally broke. We can't afford to put diesel fuel in our trucks. Insurance costs us over $50,000 a year for three trucks on the road. Something has to be done. Well, you know, this gentleman has precisely articulated the, the sort of political and economic problem that's driving this conversation in the first place. But his two prescriptions are mutually incompatible. He said he'd like to see the Saudis increase production by 9,000% or some theoretical number, right? Mm -hmm. If they did that, it would probably drive the price of oil way down. He also said he'd like to see the development of the tar sands and other unconventional oil resources. That won't happen if the price of oil goes back down. That will only happen if the price of oil stays high enough to make it economically viable. Next up. Chicago, Illinois, on our line for Democrats. Good morning. Chicago. Hey. Uh, glad I finally got through. Um, a, a few thoughts on the oil uh, situation. The, the simple fact is, is that the world is running to the point where it, it's really almost impossible to uh, continue to increase the annual rate of production. The, the Russian oil production has actually started to fall. They've been responsible for about 80% of the increase in non-OPEC supply over the past uh, decade or so. Uh, and most of the Saudi spare capacity is of the thick, sulfur-laden stuff, heavy, sour, crude. Uh, so that's part of the reason for the uh, uh, inability to refine it. Actual U.S. refining capacity is only running it at 85%. Uh, the real question is, can the developed world, the OECD, reduce demand enough to accommodate the uh, million barrels a day or so increased demand that is coming from China and India? And you know, before anybody uh, you know, says, oh, it's the fault of those Indians, uh, keep in mind that the average Indian uses uh, 1 48th as much oil per capita per year as the average American. Thanks for your call. Well, we're covering a lot of territory in short order here. Let me, let, let me just throw out a couple of things. <clears throat> the, according to Saudi oil officials, the total proven reserves of the world, the amount of oil we know is there and recoverable in the world, is greater today than it was in 1970 despite of all the oil we've extracted in the intervening 38 years because of new discoveries offshore in new parts of the Arabian Peninsula, in West Africa, and now in Brazil. I, the discovery of reserves of crude oil, though, is not the same as creating a system of pipelines, tankers, refineries to actually turn the crude oil into products that affect the retail market. And this gentleman's caller was correct about the fact that a lot of the marginal production in Saudi Arabia, according to the Saudis, uh, is what they call sour or high sulfur crude, which is much more difficult and expensive to refine and which we generally don't want. So it's, it, there's not a simple equation here. And th this isn't particularly about Saudi Arabia, except that they have the most of it. Right. Uh, but we could be having the same conversation about, you know, what's the problem in Nigeria? The problem in Nigeria is security of the pipelines and the oil installations. The absolute amount of crude oil available is really not the issue. It's, what is the issue then? Well, the issue is how that crude oil is distributed and what are the pricing policies of the various countries. You know, even before the latest run up in oil prices, they were getting the equivalent of $5 or more a gallon in Europe because of the taxing policies of the European countries. In other places, I mean, the, the, the market price of a gallon of uh, gasoline in Saudi Arabia is probably 50 cents because they choose to subsidize their own population. 
So we, we could do that, we just don't want to. Before there was this huge jump in the price of a, a barrel of oil, let's say when it was down around $35, $40 a barrel, um, now it's up to $126, $127, $128 a barrel. How much of a change in the percentage of profit going to the Saudis has there been in, with that increase? Enormous. Enormous. So the Saudis are making more money now than they ever were. Absolutely. The Saudis, they reported officially a budget surplus for their last fiscal year of $77 billion. And for the current fiscal year, if I, if my figures, if I remember the figures correctly, their current budget is based on oil revenue at an anticipated price of 60 or $65. But in fact, the price they're getting they don't actually get $125 a barrel, but they, they're now getting probably three figures for a lot of their oil. They, it's almost reminiscent of the first great oil price spike of the 1970s when the Saudis, there was a Niagara of cash pouring into Saudi Arabia to the point where they literally could not spend it all. And that's almost true today. Now, for the Saudis, much of the infrastructure that they built for the first time when they got rich in the 70s is already now obsolete. They're going to have to replace the hospitals and roads and some of the airports that they built then. Nevertheless, um, <clears throat> the availability of that much cash explains why they have just created what they call a sovereign wealth fund to take a big chunk of this money or some of this money and put it away for the future when there's less oil revenue or when the prices go back down. Our next call for Thomas Littman comes from Bethesda, Maryland on our line for independence.